Welcome to this edition of Rattling the Bars. I'm your host, Mansa Musa. Comrade George Jackson stated in one of his writings that the criminal justice system itself is the enemy of any type of resistance to fascism. Throughout this country's history, we see the use of the criminal justice system to suppress any type of resistance to fascism. J. Edgar Hoover stated that the goal of the counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, was to prevent the rise of a black messiah who would be capable of organizing black people into fighting fascism. Given our history, it's no surprise that in 2023, we're talking about an attempt to build a military-style complex for training police in Atlanta, also known as Cop City. Cop City itself will be a monument to our criminal justice system. And the fastest response to people protesting Cop City shows what this project is all about. As we speak, the state of Georgia is pursuing RICO charges for over 60 Cop City protesters. Before the crackdown on Cop City protesters, the L.A. Police Department criminal conspiracy section used agent provocateurs to set up and kill members of the Black Panther Party. The most noted agent provocateur was Louis Tagwood. Criminalizing civil disobedience was the goal of the L.A. criminal conspiracy section, and that's just one of the countless examples of state fascist crackdown on dissent. The Chicago 7, the Panther 21, anti-war protesters in the 60s, civil rights protesters, and now the Stop Cop City movement. Joining me to talk about Cop City are my colleagues Stephen Janis and Ted Grant. Welcome to Rattling the Bars. Thanks for having us. Glad and, to be back. Yeah, I'm definitely glad to have y'all back. And before we go into like unpacking Cop City, let's just let's just give context to mm -hmm. where we believe that this response is coming from. You know, we had Rodney King. Yes. We had Freddie Gray. We had uh, George Floyd. Mm -hmm. We had multiple examples of people being killed by the police. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, we had uh, outcry, national outcry, worldwide outcry against police brutality and, and attacks are being used. And the cry that be, they came on a lot of levels was police reform. Uh, I'm, I've got issues with reforming the police, but that's what they came up with. Like, we need to do something with uh, divesting the police. And as a result of that, we see now the fastest response is to say, okay, we hear you, so we're going to do something and we're gonna meet y'all demands by creating a training mechanism for the police. And the training mechanism we're gonna create, we're gonna create this state of the art facility. Mm -hmm. We're gonna create this training facility that's gonna be so magnificent that when the police come out, they're gonna be like Robocop. They're gonna be <laughs> programmed to like see the kitten in the tree, take it down. Right. They're gonna be programmed to see the little kid girl crossing the street with the bicycle, stop the car. They're gonna be programmed such they were so sanitized that when people call for the police, they won't expect the police to come and do what they're delegated to do. That's a myth. Yes. All right, here, let me let me say this here. Both of y'all went down there and, yeah. and visited Cop City. So educate our audience on, starting with you, James. Educate our audience on what is Cop City. Well, before I talk about Cop City, I just want to say that we have this idea at the Police Accountability Report that the idea that you can reform police so that police are no longer corrupt is is an ill th thought out idea. Yeah, right. You know, the, the idea that there's this beautiful police, utopian police department that will do nothing but, you know, constitutionally enforce the law is looking at the problem in the wrong way because the police department only reflects the underlying values of community. And, and in this sense, and in a sense we see in Baltimore and many of these cities, it reflects the massive wealth inequality and injustice that construct these communities. So the idea to say there's some magic solution. Right. And when you look to Baltimore, and I think Taya has talked mm -hmm. about this extensively, mm -hmm. you know, our consent decree, which we had in 2016 with the federal right. government, has led to tens of millions of dollars spent on on the police department, but nothing into the community. So right. why do you think that's going to help anything? So so that should be the first thing we say before we approach this idea of Cop City. Right. Now, now, in March, Tay and I traveled to Cop City, mm -hmm. and you know we really were on the ground and looking at it. And I think you know Cop City, as you said, is an expression of this idea. And it's sort of an extension of a, a lot of concepts that we'll get into as we go on. Mm -hmm. but, but the main thing about it was that it was very interesting to see the synergy between corporate wealth, you right. know, 
know, which is the Atlanta Police Foundation mm -hmm. and and the political might of the police. The two coincided in this like lopsided neoliberal, I guess you would call alliance mm -hmm. that wanted to further push the myth that you're talking about, that somehow investing more money in police will make a community better. And and the biggest part of that is is when you look at Cop City taking this beautiful, you know, sort of very, uh, I think, um, limited amount of force and tearing it down is, I think, emblematic of how corrupt that idea is, essentially. And let me describe for you a little bit, since we did go there in person, mm -hmm. what the Wilani Forest is like. So there's over 300 acres of this forest, and it's considered one of the four lungs of Atlanta. That is how important this forest right. is. So its preservation is absolutely necessary, because if you knock down, like they're planning to 85 acres of this forest. It can contribute to soil erosion, which means there's going to be more flooding. If you take down these trees, then you're going to be limiting the amount of air pollution that can be uh, dealt with as these trees are beautiful natural carbon captures. They produce oxygen. And th these trees are absolutely essential to keeping those neighborhoods as well as the city of, of Atlanta cool and pleasant to be in. So this is a beautiful forest that was originally deeded for the recreational use of the people that live in the uh, in, uh, unincorporated DeKalb County right. that surround it. And those are primarily black working right. class neighborhoods. It was supposed to be kept for their use, for their enjoyment, for their recreation. And instead, 85 acres is going to be raised to build this complex. Now they've scaled back the complex a little bit. The um, Atlanta uh, Public Safety Foundation originally planned to have this complex have demolitions, as, but now they're only going to have firing ranges. <laughs> they're right. not going to yeah. do the demolitions yeah. we're, we're, anymore. We're, 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 <laughs> we're just going to shoot things. They're going to have a nightclub. They're going to have an apartment building. They're going to have mock city streets. So it does seem, I think, the residents have a genuine concern as to what type of training they're going to be receiving there. And, you know, when we visited the neighborhoods, surrounding it, you would see, you know, housing that was just, you know, in, in disrepair. And also in Atlanta, we would see $750,000 condos rising, but no, but an extreme shortage of, of affordable housing. So they're building apartments, they're building, you know, a mock village, but mm. they're not building affordable housing for people in the city or helping people to repair the housing that they have. I think that's a perfect, you know, sort of analogy or metaphor for what this is and, really and about. Go, and, and to resonate your point, when the whole in design of the police is supposed to be to make this, the community safer, and and it should be a, 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 a cohesion between the two, but in this regard, we mm -hmm. see that one you taking is ecological nightmare Absolutely. to start, mm -hmm. you know, one, and that that means the quality of life in them in that community is going to get worse. But more importantly, when you have a depressed environment, yes, then. Is right for police brutality yeah. because you now you can justify coming into the neighborhoods and saying, "Oh, well, if crime is running them up." Yeah, you you create a, such a depressed environment yep. where people don't have no alternative, and it's not a justification for criminal behavior, but it's a, but it's, a, it's the reality of yes. what you do yes. to the uh, poor and oppressed community. But going forward, okay, let's look at how do how do how do uh, how did this come about because. I mean, you tell you was talking about, and and this is really the the, the insanity part about this whole thing with Atlanta. Because we was talking about when you look at Atlanta, okay, you look at Dr. King, you look at the Civil Rights Movement, you look at everything that went on that in Atlanta to get Atlanta to become what they call the Black Mecca, yes. right? With more like a black mistake, <laughs> all right? And and in reality, because you had the the, uh, the middle class, the the liberal elitist middle class. That's, that's in Atlanta that controlled the, uh, the most of the political machinery. They 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 weighed in. They sided with this. So they so where are you? Who, so how is the people being represented in this in this community? Oh well, well, something I noticed is that there seems to be a divide between the old guard of black civil rights activists who eventually moved into positions of leadership in Atlanta and the new younger generation of activists. The old black civil rights uh, folks, the NAACP, other activists, other leaders in positions of power, they've remained notably silent or have actually co-signed onto this project, whereas the younger generation of activists are pushing back and asking their elders, why are Aren't they stepping forward? Why are they allowing this to happen? Ninety million dollars is going to be invested into this. And as Stephen rightly pointed out, there's a need for affordable housing. How were they able to raise ninety million dollars? Well, I can tell you, 
Home Depot put mm-hmm. their money in. Delta, Delta Airlines put their money in. Merrill Lynch put their money in. Inspire Brands, which is actually the parent company for Dunkin' Donuts. And I won't make a, a joke about cops and donuts. <laughs> but uh, th- these, com- Coca-Cola, it's like a who's who of yeah. like corporate, corporate, corporate of, 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 cor- yeah, of corporate fine. America. And I think... It so clearly shows something that many people have discussed, which is that there is a line between what police do that they police are primarily protectors of private property mm, right. and capital interests. Mm-hmm. And I think this is so clear that money is being poured into a project to further the police's ability to protect private capital right. as opposed to genuinely public safety. Well, you know, as we were talking about before, this is kind of the culmination of the neoliberal crisis that, you know, has started years ago. And one of the ideas of neoliberalism that I think is often misunderstood with regards to the police is the fact that neoliberalism is supposed to be the idea that you d- disband government programs because the private market can, mm-hmm. can solve the problems. But what it is in reality is that private capital ask government to actually ensure their profits. That's and, right. and that's what's different about it. Like in Baltimore here, we have developers who use the government to subsidize and ensure their profits. And so what happens when you when you do that is you have a tremendous imbalance of wealth and a tremendously destructive political economy. And the only way that you can keep that, and I think a lot, and sort of tap down on the uprising about the unfairness is, is to use policing. And the best way to mythologize policing is to invest in things symbolically like Cop City, where mm-hmm. you're saying, look what we're doing. We're building this beautiful. And 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 I think partly it was interesting because people mentioned to us that this was called so-called the Atlanta way, right? You yes. Know, where, yes. you know, they kind of get together with the powers that be and the neo- neoliberal, uh, I don't know what to call them, tools. And they conjure this vision that somehow investing in public safety is going to somehow improve the underlying condition, just as in true. True. Neoliberalism has caused an, an historic income inequality, and building cop city is not going to create safety. Building affordable housing might. Right, and that and that's really that's really what's going. And it's the mythology that continues. Yeah, it continues oh yeah, to it's stay. definitely continues because the reality is that if you give people jobs, if you give people housing, yeah. if you give people quality without education, lead in it. you give people yeah without lead, in, you give people mm-hmm. uh, holistic food, you get you yeah. invest in people, then you don't need the police no. because people want to take care of themselves. Yeah. But the, but but going back, looking at some of the things that's going on in in Atlanta, mm-hmm. and and what really uh, I found like just outrageous is we talking about we talking about a place where you know at one point in time the police was literally so people were so fearful of the police and terrorized them that they wouldn't even come out of their houses at night for, because of Jim Crow and mm-hmm. Jim Crow, and now we have a, a like a situation where you're actually because of corporate America. And, co- yes. and, and corporate America lining your pockets and corporate America investing in your campaign and corporate America ensuring that you stay in the in this seat of so-called power to continue to do the bidding of capitalists, that now you take you turn a, a, blind, a blind eye to the reality that you're encouraging a, a military industrial complex style mm-hmm. police department to police your community because they're not going to police the, the more influent, they don't have to police no. the more influent. They're going to be the, the barricade between the affluent community and the, the poor and yeah. oppressed community. Yeah. You, you know, I, I just, w- when you said that, that made me think of the reaction, because this is something that Atlanta residents pointed out to us. In 2020, uh, when Rayshard Brooks was brutalized by the police, there mm-hmm. was an uprising um, in Atlanta. And I think the people at the time, the politicians, the people in power, the corporations, Coca-Cola, Home Depot, Wells Fargo, mm-hmm. all those folks who are funding this project, they got very scared. They very much wanted to protect their investment, their capital. And that's one of the reasons why they're turning to this public safety complex. And I think one of the things that people don't often mention is that in the, ca- the uh, area around Walani Forest, mm-hmm. the, uh, that black working class area, that's unincorporated DeKalb County. They have no representation mm. on that city council <laughs> that is voting for yeah. Cop that City. So they literally continuous. have no other choice mm. than to go out in the street and, and, and protest and to hold signs. They have no other way of expressing their voice. They are literally disenfranchised when it comes yeah, to they, this and project. And that was strategic. Because they, they yes. like you say, if they put if they go in an area where it's not incorporated, right, then they they, they don't have to they don't have to, to worry about the pretense. Of, yes. of being like yep. having you know like the politicians don't have to worry about the pretense of being concerned yeah. or, or coming forward and, and reading all the script. Yeah, we we gonna you know we gonna see about we gonna investigate. <laughs> they don't have to come up with that. They can just say like, well, hey, 
it's business as usual. Mm -hmm. But okay, let's talk about let's talk about uh the indictment yeah. of the sixty people under Rico. Now this yes. is here is probably the most ominous thing I've seen in yes. in, totally in terms agree. of uh you, you, the utilization of the criminal justice system. And George Jackson said it's the institution that's the threat. And he was specifically talking about the criminal justice system. Well, you take a, 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 a act, RICO Act, and primarily responsible for uh, where it's really a catch-all. We could be, we could get charged with RICO right now <laughs> yes, we if could. we say the wrong thing. <laughs> and then somebody say, oh, yeah, well, they was talking about blowing up something. Mm -hmm. and, and we could get charged with RICO mm -hmm. and, and, and be find ourselves in front of a federal grand jury Trying to you know rationalize why we our freedom of speech should be recognized, but where okay how did this come about? Yeah, I mean I think as Taya was talking about, there there was a tremendous fear in the neoliberal coalition that she discussed mm -hmm. with corporations and police, especially because they actually mentioned Richard Brooks, who was a man who was killed by police after falling asleep in a drive through line in, in a restaurant. So I think there was tremendous fear after that, and they kind of got together, and they saw these groups, these grassroots groups mm -hmm. rising up, and like, what are we going to do about them? You know, how are we going to completely, I think, destroy right. the ability to protest? Right. Because this indictment ha is one of the most scary things, yes. and I've been covering the criminal justice for 20 years. <laughs> Years that mm -hmm. I've ever read. This thing is insane. Yeah. I mean, they do stuff like say they had letter writing campaigns. They argued the First Amendment. They uh, gave people numbers to call when they were in jail. Things that are mm -hmm. all supposed to be <laughs> fundamentally protected, and mm -hmm. they indicted people for it. Yeah, they yeah. indicted Pre people yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah, and, yeah. and and the preamble is like an introduction. I guess they have a little waxing philosophic on anarchism. Oh my gosh, they had three pages describing anarchism. They talked about collectivism, mutual aid, yeah. sacrificing. <laughs> Individual needs for the collective good. And I'm, I'm reading this. All this I'm like, they're, really making, I was gonna to say, me, you know? <laughs> they're making anarchism sound pretty great. But what was, I mean, if it wasn't so tragic what they were doing, right. I would have to laugh. They talked about handing out flyers as part of the criminal conspiracy. They talked about making zines. 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 The little, the little, the little, Pamphlets. you know, a photocopy. You put a staple in yeah. the middle mm -hmm. that you hand out. Maybe you give them out to 20 or 30 people. They're talking about zines as being part of being a conspiracy. And, and one of the, and just to also add to this, mm -hmm. they've also used domestic terrorism charges and yeah. weaponized it against the yeah. protesters. And one of the most tragic things about the use of the domestic terrorism charges is that originally the the law the law changing the, the exact meaning of domestic terrorism charges was done in order to ensure that Dylan Roof, That's who right. massacred those people would be able to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And at the time, uh, an elected official went on record and said, and said, you know what, broadening the definition of domestic terrorism may seem like a good thing right now, but this could be weaponized against activists. In particular, it could be weaponized against folks in the Black Lives Matter movement. And what do we see right now? It's being weaponized against activists. It's being weaponized against people who are using their freedom of speech and people who are involved in anti-racist and anti-police brutality movements. I mean, this is Line. Instead of relying on a modicum of government structure, anarchy relies on human association instead of government to fulfill all human needs. I mean, what is that supposed to be an indictment of something? What, what, you know, what, I mean, what is that? What is the community is going to rely upon itself <laughs> to, you know, have its own power. I mean, yeah. it's basically saying that the power only relies uh, lies with us and, and not and, with you. And, and to your point, uh, when you're taking a weaponized, now you're weaponizing. Uh, just civil disobedience, but exactly. more importantly, but the more basics. importantly, but more importantly, you weaponizing, you saying that anybody that has a problem with an unpopular policy or procedure, mm -hmm. depend on how they anything other than saying nothing. Yeah, right. Because you, if you say anything, if if this get by, if yeah. this wash, if this get by, then this becomes the template for. All social, all social disobedience, and yes. and to go back to your point, Jan, mainly when we look at uh, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. when we look at any type of protest, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a good example of how they could have used it and the kids at Sandy Hook. Cause mm -hmm. remember when, remember when 300,000 kids came to Washington. Yeah. They said that because about yeah. the gun laws. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they, it yes. was 300 kids, juvenile. I mean, young, young kids. Yes, it came, could have. But they could, they could turn around and say, oh. Uh, no, this is uh, anarchy. This is, you yeah. know, indict right. them on the RICO for yeah. coming out talking about the NRA. 
right? Yeah. That's us. That's us. And I mean, it, you know, even more absurd, like we, we speak to people from the Atlanta Bail Fund who they also indicted for money laundering. <laughs> the amount, total amount at question is $6,000. Just you know? $6,000. It you, was you, absolutely absurd. And can I just add, yeah, ahead, very, add. Very, very specifically, this money laundering that they accused, that, and, and we spoke to Marlon Krauts of yeah. the uh, uh -huh. Atlanta Bail Found, uh, Solidarity Foundation. Mm -hmm. So what they do is that if you are exercising your, your right to free speech, you're at a protest, and you, get and you get arrested, you can call them and they will help raise money to get you out. And you write so, your number. So, so what they, but they criminalize, they put this in, in the charges yeah. that if you wrote their number on your arm so that you could call them later to be bailed out, that was considered part of a criminal conspiracy. Yeah. And that $6,000 that Stephen mentioned, that money that was part of the money laundering, that was money that was for gas, flyers, printing media, yard signs, that's the money laundering they're talking about. Yeah. I have never seen charges so trumped up I'm, in my I'm, life. It's, it's I'm insane. Gonna you, I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you what the real money laundering is. The real money laundering is the fact that you spend all this money from the state's coffer to prosecute people on these bogus charges. Yeah. Oh, because thank all you. the money yes. that you spend all this money, you know, I remember Susan McDougal when when they when the Kenneth Starr went at her and all that money he spent mm. on keeping right. her locked up. The, that mo the amount of money that was spent on that, they could have built houses for everybody yeah. in the goddamn own country. I mean, so this is the same thing here. You spend all this money to justify uh, this insanity yes. that you call uh, justice, and and that you could spend the same money on on better schools, mm -hmm. uh, safer communities, in the Absolutely. sense of providing more housing, well, which would create a safer environment, people yes. more invest in it, jobs. Uh, you could spend this money on this, but instead you're going to spend some money on saying, you're going to criminalize somebody for saying, oh, I want somebody going to bail me out. I can't remember that number, so I'm going to write that number on my arm, exactly. or I'm going to have that number in my yeah. pocket. Exactly. Wherever I had that number at, uh, or if I hear you somebody call, I would call this number right here. So or, or all y'all in a conspiracy because y'all conspired to do what? To get out? Exactly. The one thing we can say exactly. about this is that it, it must be what they have done, what, what the you know activists in Atlanta have done has put so much fear mm. in the criminal justice system, in the neoliberal system, that they must feel like they have to you know squash it out to nothing. Because honestly, they, they have put, put, painted, put a mirror on the ugliness of what Cop City really is, mm -hmm. and the ugliness of the idea that underlines it. And and we went down there, when we were down there, like we actually saw quite tragically the aftermath of after police yes. had, had like a military organization gone in and just, you know, thrown people out. But it was just like there was a campfire. There and there were, were like tents. There was like a tree house. Yeah. And it, ju it just, it was, you could was, tell that this was a place that like there were families had been there, you know, that, that people were, yeah, that people had been people enjoying the space. Concern. And it had just been utterly destroyed. The and only thing that was left was um, a memorial to Mani Terran, La Tortuguita. Okay, right. That was, killed. yeah, that was yeah. left. That was left to them. But it was really quite sad. But it was, it was, it was humble. Do you know what I mean? It was well, humble. I already know because, like, and and, 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 and uh, as I'm sitting back thinking about it, right? Because what what they what they did or what they what they're doing, like you say, the, it's no longer about Cop City. Mm -mm. See the narrative narrative sh shifting. It's no longer about Cop City. It's about these anarchists, these yes. saboteurs, these agent provocateurs that's coming down there to destroy the city. But man, you was, talk was talking about this out earlier, tell you, When you look at the list of people that they that they indicted, mm -hmm. it's like the who's who don't live around in Georgia. It's the mm -hmm. who's who. I, where you live at? I don't live in Georgia. And, right. and you know, like out. You know, you know what? And this is a classic Southern tactic. In back in, in during the civil rights era, this was a classic Southern tactic that they used. The outsiders coming down here to start trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. the bus boy, the buses coming down here to start trouble. So this is they 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 going back to that narrative like, oh, outsiders coming down here because the people of Atlanta don't have no problem with this because it's it's for the yes. people of Atlanta. So why would you have a problem? You're not gonna be down here. You know, you you know, y'all mad because we're gonna have a safe police place. But you know what, that's, you, I'm so glad you pointed that out because that is exactly the narrative that was fed to the mainstream media, especially when it, the first oh, charges came out of the domestic terrorism charges, which happened at the Willani Forest Music Festival. There were, uh, <laughs> there were 33 people charged. 
Uh, 31 of them were from outside of Georgia, and they highlighted every state. I think there was one that was actually from from outside the United States. Every single state that they were from, and only two people from Georgia were actually charged with domestic terrorism. And I was thinking to myself, that's very purposeful, because the people I spoke with said there were plenty of Georgia residents there. And it was very much to create a narrative that these are outside agitators, that our people here in the community are fine with this. And these people are coming in and stirring our good folks. Up. Yeah. That's exactly I mean, what I got. Unfortunately, from that. the Constitution applies no matter what state you're in. It technically, right. so. <laughs> and, and I don't you, even know why that's, that's right. an issue. Something else that's problematic about this because we recognize that when we had protests and and Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, the war in Vietnam, when people protested, they came from all over the world to 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 express solidarity with this mm -hmm. issue. Now. You making you scaring people off by saying you come to if you come exactly. down to Georgia you, right. you 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 cross the state line we gonna we gonna find some out draconian law to say you transporting ill thoughts to bring into Georgia to create a problem for the Georgian citizens therefore we are gonna charge you up under RICO and or we are gonna charge you with conspiracy or we are gonna charge you with everything but a homicide. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think that the idea here is to you know. Really, it's not just about crushing dissent. It is affirming the idea that dissent is somehow more destabilizing than the economic system mm, they right, created, right? right? Mm. That, oh my God, the real threat is about 20 kids sitting around a campfire, mm. not Delta Airlines and Coca-Cola right. destroying the environment, <laughs> wow, yeah. um, you know, destroying the world we live in. That's not the threat. The threat is the kids that like, you know, created, you know, little, um, like you said, uh, tree houses tree and, yeah. and sat inside a forest. That's the real threat. And that's the whole point of this is to somehow conjure this. It's like the last gasp of the neoliberal sort of violence that we see. And I would just add to that one of the things that I noticed in that incredibly lengthy indictment was how they kept on talking about solidarity and mutual yeah. aid as if it was some kind of evil. Right. And like you were talking about, people from all over the world came to participate in our protests in this country during Absolutely. our during a variety during of civil uprising. rights movements. So why is it a crime to receive support, help, brotherhood and aid from other people who, let's say, don't absolutely live in your city or aren't directly right. impacted by the crisis that's occurring in your community, why is it a crime to receive support from others? Because neoliberal capitalism is inherently divisive. Right. And, they, and, and any community that erupts mm -hmm. as an abeyance to it becomes a threat. And that's and that's the, that's really the threat because mm -hmm. we if if this was existed back during the times of the abolition of slavery, then everybody that all abolitionists oh would have been child with the recall. You're so you know, right. All, if this oh was on everybody, yeah. everyone everybody, on the Underground Railroad, everybody on the yep. Underground Railroad would have been had yep. would have been charged with uh, conspiracy to disrupt capitalism, and that's mm -hmm. the, you know, and, and at, at exactly. the end of the day, I mean, that's you, what the really like you say, Jan. That's the problem. The problem yeah. is not the problem is not uh, the civil disobedience. The problem is the the capitalism and fascism and oppression that creates an environment for for police to run them up because yes. they're 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 the occupying force in the community. When we see in Baltimore, you know, the, the community was economically destabilized by deindustrialization and what do they do but send in militarized policing to solve the problem. When is I mean we could have you know what's really strange about it for me as a person who's not necessarily a capitalist, capitalists are supposed to be more efficient with money. Well if mm -hmm. we had just invested in the community, we wouldn't need all these damn police. And I think that's what they're trying to say in Cop City is like if you if that's, you want, if you take that ninety million dollars and put it into us, yes. we will show you what we can do as a community. And remember but that. And remember that was one. Of, and remember in this conversation about the police and and getting them out of the community and 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 uh, getting them to, just getting them away from us was to invest in the community in the form of like bringing social workers in, mm -hmm. bringing mental health agencies, you know, yeah. to bring people into the community to help the community. Uh, Get get stronger as opposed to bringing the police and and the, the limited amount of police that you have. But now they they didn't shift to the nerd. We don't need we not. It's not even about the police no more now. No. They they and and unless we can get back on the, the subject matter of what's really going on down there, it's gonna be about these. It's gonna be about these sixty people. 
Yeah. You know, so, something that I think we really found in having this conversation is that it's highlighted what a threat our solidarity is, what a threat that is to our government. And that's actually really shameful that human beings coming together in mutual aid and support of each other is considered a threat. And something that we tried to point out to people when we did our reporting on Cop City is you may think this is a problem in Atlanta mm. and in Georgia. And you think this isn't going to be a problem for you? Yeah. Well, we know for a fact because this is part of their advertisement material for the, the training facility <laughs> that 40 percent, uh, roughly 40 percent of the police officers that are going to be trained at Cop City are going to be from outside of Georgia. They're planning on training police officers and sheriffs from all around oh, yeah, the oh, country. Oh, yeah, they can do that, but they can't, but people can't come down there in solidarity. And, and Angela Davis made that observation in, in her book, if they come in the morning, say if they come for me in the morning, they'll come for you in the night. Absolutely. And, and, uh, but, but as we close out, right, mm -hmm. how do how do uh, people get access to the the uh, indictment? Oh, okay. And how yeah. do they get access to some more information on cops? Just here? Google Georgia Bureau of Investigation and um, uh, press release or indictment or, um, or the Georgia State's Attorney General website has it posted a link to it. I honestly, I don't usually tell people to read indictments. <laughs> and, you know, there's this idea of a speaking indictment versus just a very basic indictment. Well, this is like some sort of like, um, you know, this is a <laughs> blueprint indictment oh, yeah. where it's like this is a blueprint to suppress all human dissent. It's anti-humanist, you know, in its essence, because, you know, if we can't have solidarity amongst ourselves, if we can't have community, you know, coalesce around an idea that we don't like, then it's game over. Yeah, it's game it's over. It's game over. This is this is 1983 in its rawest form. Yeah. And you know what? This isn't just, uh, Stephen made an excellent suggestion for everyone to read this indictment I, I, I because it is a blueprint. It. Also, Cop City itself is a blueprint because yeah. we're looking in our city, Baltimore, right mm -hmm. now at our own Cop City being built at a historic black university at Coppin State. We're looking at possibly a $330 million police training center being built in my city. So if you think Cop City can't come to you. And and, and and as we close on this note, you know, that really sickens me because you saying an HBCU mm -hmm. and then you want then and and now we want and the amount of money they kick back to them, you know, that's automatically going like Oh, okay, well, we're going to look that way as opposed to investing that money. You uh, you, you don't need to really look farther when to invest. You can ride up any street and see the abandoned minimums in yes. the city. And so you, if you want to stop on any block and say, well, I'm going to invest $100,000 in this block or $200,000 in this block, $400,000 in this block, the whole city be uh, revitalized, yes. beautified, and you, and, the, and you won't need the police because people be investing in the community. I thank y'all for joining me uh, on, on this conversation. Cause yeah, thank thank you important. for having us back. Yeah, and I, I like having y'all back because it's important. One one thing, y'all, y'all on the ground, y'all all things about exposing police and, and corruption when it comes to the, that particular institution. And we need people really to recognize that, you know, we're not talking about Cop City. We're not talking about uh, Cop and State Cop City. We're talking about a system of fascism and oppression that breeds conditions for people to be subjugated and dehumanized. And then the, the response to that dehumanization when they when they seek to, to self-determination, the response is to build a cop city, mm. yes. to, to yeah. uh, militarize the police. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, and uh, we continue to ask you to continue to support Rattling the Bars and the Real News. It's only on Rattling the Bars and the Real News that you get this cutting edge uh, journalism, this cutting edge investigation from both Jan and Taya. They're always in the space, always exposing the injustice, always exposing those things that are problematic with this country. And it's only from the rattling the bars and the real news that you will get this kind of information. You're not going to get this type of information on main media. You're not going to get this type of information on major networks. you only going to get it on rattling the bars. you only going to get it on the real news. Because guess what? We are really the news. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.